want you to turn in your Bibles. We're going to be turning lots of places, uh, but I want you to turn right now to Luke 7 and hold your place there. As we have uh, typically here at Reach Church, we teach kind of through a series. I, I like doing that. A lot of times we'll teach through a book of the Bible like we did uh, through Ephesians much of last year. Uh, we're going to get to that here later this year, but uh, the way the schedule and the calendar has been working out, we're kind of having a, a bit of one-off sermons, and this morning is one of those as we are digging into doubt, talking a little bit about doubt. Who's married in the room? Wave at me. All right, now I want, to, I want the men who are not married and hope someday to be married to wave at me. Are there any of those guys? A few of them. Sorry to single you guys out. Didn't intend to do that, but I guess I kind of did intend to do that. <laughs> Uh, men, let's talk for a little bit, shall we? When it comes to Sammy and I and our marriage, I have a bad habit that can sometimes cause grief, and I wonder if you guys have it. I believe myself more than I believe my wife sometimes. Husbands, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah? Here's what I mean by that. Any of you had this conversation with your wife from across the house? She'll say, hey, I need you to go grab this thing from the fridge for me or grab this thing from the laundry room. And I'm like, deal, easy, got it. And what you already, wives already know where I'm going with this, right? I'll stand in the fridge, I'll open the door, and I'll be like, that thing is not in here. It's probably never been in here. I have turned the inside of this fridge upside down and it's not in here. So I will call to Sammy. I'm looking right where you told me for towels, mustard, prescriptions, $20, $20, keys, our youngest child, wherever, whatever it is I've been sent to look for. I'm looking right where you said. I promise you it's not here. Husbands, how many of you have ever uttered those famous last words, right? Like, it's not here. And then husbands, here's what happens. Our wives will say something along these lines. It is there. Please don't make me have to come get it for you, right? Right? And we say, I'm looking, I promise it's not here. And then what do we hear, guys? It makes us start to sweat, right? We hear footsteps coming towards us. And we're like, as soon as that happens, we're like, she's going to find it. Like, she's going to find it. And I'm going to feel terrible, right? What happens if you're like me is that Sammy shows up. I have been standing in front of the fridge for five minutes looking for one thing that I am convinced is not in our refrigerator. Those towels are not where she said they would be. That $20 is not where she said it would be. And in all of three seconds, she finds it exactly where she said it would be. Husbands, how many of you have had this experience? You're afraid to admit it. Wives, how many of you remember your husband having this experience? Yes, right, fairly universal, right? It's in those moments when I don't find something right away that I tell myself, it's not here. Once Sammy gets here, she's going to see it and she'll know that I looked hard and it's, and it's gone. But somehow I have a less than 1% success rate in that process. It's always right where she said it. I don't know what goes wrong with my vision to not see exactly what she uh, is telling me to see. But as often as she's right and I'm wrong, do you know the worst part about this? It doesn't stop me from doubting her next time. Right? Husbands, this is probably going to happen to you in the next 48 hours. Even though your wife bats a thousand at this, we're still like, I promise you it's not here this time, right? And they're going to be like, remember what the pastor said? When I come, I'm going to find it, right? We doubt. And I'll just tell you, doubt gets me in trouble more often than I'd like to admit. In my life, I have doubted things that have cost me dearly. I doubted that a cop would be waiting over the next hill. Anybody ever paid that price, right? I've doubted that I can, I've doubted that I will drop what I'm carrying if I carry too many bags of groceries. No, I won't drop it. It's cool. It's cool, right? And then all of a sudden, I drop it. I've doubted that I'll nap too long so I don't set an alarm. I've doubted that I had the date wrong for an appointment. I drove all the way to Vegas once, a one-hour drive from the town we lived in, just to realize, uh, to pick someone up at the airport, just to realize I was one day early. (laughs) I didn't verify, right? I doubted. I doubted that I had the date wrong. 
I doubted that something that should take me 10 hours to get done would actually take me 10 hours to get done, including every home project I've ever gotten involved in, right? I doubted that one bad day of eating would make a difference on the scale. Listen, if you're over 25, let me tell you, it makes a difference, right? (laughs) I've doubted that one bad decision would lead to two or three more, and often they do. Anybody relate to any of these doubts so far? Look, to doubt, without question, doubt is part of human experience. I think most of us are skeptics at heart. We like to believe that we know something. We like to believe that we know it better than someone else. And so we're afraid to fully trust. And in no relationship in your life does that show up more often than your relationship with the one who made you. When we throw in doubt with things like a poor memory and sin's effect on our hearts, doubt becomes a very real and present threat, an element of our human experience. Thankfully, when it comes to our walk with God, he does not encourage us to doubt. But he does not abandon us in our doubt either. And he sure got a lot to say about it. Over the last 18 months or so, whether it's been in one-on-one conversation with some of you or in passing reference here on a Sunday morning, I've made mention of the story that we're about to dig into with both feet this morning. It's one of the best examples we get in the New Testament of what it looks like to doubt and how Jesus helps us as we wrestle. So I want to unpack this story with you in a little bit more detail this morning because I believe this. Listen, if we approach our doubts with shame, which often happens for the believer, I'm doubting this and now I'm ashamed that I'm questioning if God is working here. I'm ashamed because I had a moment of unbelief. If we approach our doubts with shame or with selfish motives because we're hoping that God is wrong, we run the risk of totally wrecking our faith. In fact, there's a conversation that's been happening, especially among young believers, people in between 20 and 40 years of age or so, it's been coming up a lot. Maybe if you scroll through YouTube or you, or you read anything about faith and news, you know that the term deconstruction has become fairly popular. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Deconstruction, this concept that you and I might grow up in church. Maybe you, you grew up like me and you had parents who were always at church and then at some point in your adulthood, somewhere between 18 and 30 or 40 or 50, you decide... I think I'm going to take this whole thing apart. Some people deconstruct their faith and find themselves stronger on the other side. My perspective and opinion is that most people deconstruct it and leave it disassembled. Our deconstruction of our faith has become something of a trend. The idea that we would question everything and see what happens has become incredibly common in the church. People that have written the songs that we sing on Sunday mornings have completely abandoned their walk with God. People who were teaching in churches just like ours have woke up and decided, I don't think I believe this anymore. Doubt crept in. And look, I'm not saying that doubt is something that is always bad, but I am telling you that if we're not careful... Our battles with doubt, if we handle them wrong, will lead us away from the work of God in our lives instead of toward Him. But what if we could grasp what God thinks about our doubts or what He thinks about us as we doubt? What if we could endure those doubts with Him instead of apart from Him? That's where we're headed together this morning. Would you pray with me? God, we ask uh, that Your Word would breathe on us. Holy Spirit, we need you to sit with us as we open your word together. I ask that you'd speak to hearts and settle in us deeply uh, your favor, your comfort, your conviction. May we leave changed in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most confident men in the entire New Testament in terms of his faith is a man that we call John the Baptist. 
Jesus knew him as my cousin John. The miraculous stories of both of these men's conception and their birth is told, both of their stories are told in in Luke chapter 1. There are two cousins. What are their names? Elizabeth and Mary. They're both visited by the same angel in close proximity to one another, a few months apart with amazing news. They are both going to be pregnant with very special children. Now this was a miracle for Elizabeth if you know the story because she was barren. She's probably a woman who, um, if, if we understand context right, she's probably in her late 30s, maybe mid-30s. She's clearly barren because she has not had any children. That wasn't a cultural decision that you made in the first century. If you could have them, you had as many as you could have. So Elizabeth is barren. And this angel shows up to tell her she's going to have a son. Obviously, it's a miracle for Mary to have a baby because she's not married. She's a virgin. So Mary and Elizabeth are going to have a miracle. Each of them are going to have a miracle baby. And if you grew up in church, you know the stories well. If you don't, they're worth reading. Two women receive amazing gifts that only God could bring into their lives. And these women are entrusted alongside their husbands with raising, literally, I would argue, two of the most significant, well, Jesus, the Son of God, and John the Baptist, the most significant men to have ever been born. Jesus, the very Son of God and His cousin who would pave the way for His ministry that would culminate in the victorious work of his shed blood on the cross. And it's in Luke chapter 1 that something very interesting happens. And I want you to bear with me. We're going to kind of take a long journey this morning. So I want you to bear with me in this context. Mary and Elizabeth have both been visited by this angel. His name is Gabriel. He gives both of them very good, amazing news. They're going to be moms. And it says this in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 39. It says, At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When, listen to this, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon, listen to this, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Let's just pause here for a minute because there is miracle after miracle happening right here in this moment. First of all, Elizabeth knows that Mary is pregnant. This is before the mail service. Obviously, before anything even remotely close to modern technology. Scripture says that as soon as Mary finds out this news from Gabriel, she leaves to go visit her cousin. Do you know what that means? That the Holy Spirit is the one who tells Elizabeth, as soon as Mary shows up, the Holy Spirit says, your cousin's pregnant with the Son of God. Huge miracle here. Huge miracle. But it gets better, right? Because the other, the other miracle is this. Elizabeth's in utero son, her baby, who's about three months in development, knows that Jesus is in Mary's womb. It says as soon as they showed up, her baby is kicking. He's confirming, hey, that's him. That's him. This baby hasn't even seen the light of day yet. He has not breathed in oxygen. And yet in this moment, in three months of development, he knows that's the Son of God on your front porch. Miracle after miracle. And John's confidence grew with his age. John chapter 1, he begins to announce to the world that Jesus is the Messiah, God's only Son. We don't have a lot of time to cover this passage of Scripture, but John is baptizing people. And people are coming to him to be baptized. And some of them are saying, hey, are you, uh, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? And John is telling them, no, I'm not. I was sent ahead of him. 
He's coming. I was sent ahead of the Messiah. In fact, he says, I am who's coming. The Messiah is so much greater than me. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Now, that's a big deal because in the first century, that was a job that even slaves weren't expected to do. And John is saying, the guy who's coming, the Messiah is so much better than me. I'm not even worthy to take his shoes off. And then in John 1, 29, it says the next day after he said that, Jesus was coming toward him and John said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I've seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. Now look, we're laying a groundwork here. Here's what I want you to understand. In in the womb, John knew Jesus is the Son of God. Now, if you're like me and, and John, you don't remember anything from those nine months of gestation in your life. But he, it is affirmed to John again at 30 years of age that Jesus is the Son of God. We'll get into this in a little bit, but when John baptizes Jesus, it says that heaven, the word is ripped open and the Holy Spirit descends like a dove and the voice of God the Father says, that's my Son. John knows that Jesus is the Son of God. He knows it. He's sure of it. He even sends the guys that are in his group, his disciples, to start following Jesus. That's how Andrew, the brother of Peter, becomes a disciple of Jesus. John points at him and says, quit following me, Andrew. Follow him. He's the Son of God. Now, look with me, if you want to, to Luke chapter 3. John's been baptizing people. John's specific ministry, uh, some, maybe your version of the Bible calls him a forerunner. John's specific ministry is to go ahead of Jesus to prepare the way for the ministry of the Messiah because what Jesus would teach would turn everything on its head from what people had understood from a religious context. So John is preparing those hearts. He's calling them to get baptized for what we call the, repent, the repentance of sins. Baptism is this symbol of I'm, I'm not the person I used to be anymore. That person's dead and now I'm alive. So he's baptizing people. And his ministry is growing. And then John gets himself in some trouble. In Luke 3.19 it says this, When John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, And all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Herod was an evil ruler. He's a Jewish, Rome-appointed ruler over what would have been called in the Old Testament the nation of Israel. So he is Jewish and part of the Roman government. That means nobody likes him. He's not living a life that honors God. He likes his brother's wife, who is also his cousin, Getting gross, right? Getting complicated. So he steals his brother's wife, and John calls Herod out and says, he calls that for what it is. That's sin. Don't do that. That's wrong. You're not honoring God. And Herod, in response, locks John up in prison. And this is a significant moment in the Gospels for this reason. And I want you to understand this. John spent his whole life getting prepared to do the ministry of getting the people prepared for Jesus. And not long after Jesus shows up, John is thrown in prison. So we read these four Gospels, and what do we see? Jesus is making blind eyes see again. He's healing leprous skin and reversing its effects. He's waking up dead people on multiple occasions. He heals someone when he's not even in the room. He's not even where they're at. He just says the word, and when the servants go home, that person is healed. He's doing all of this stuff, and John has been waiting for it, and John has believed for it, and John has been the first one to be confident of it, and he doesn't get to see any of it because he's in prison. 
He gets to see maybe a little bit before Jesus' ministry really kicks off and he sits in prison while Jesus' ministry begins to grow. He hears about miracles. He hears about the teaching. He hears about the authority. He hears about the boldness of Jesus. He's able to celebrate it, but he has to celebrate it in chains in a dark, lonely cell. God was up to big stuff here in Jesus, and John didn't get to see most of it. Now we fast forward to Luke chapter 7. Jesus has just performed two miraculous healings. He healed the servant of a Roman centurion. Now that's a big deal. This centurion sent his servants to Jesus and said, Hey, one of my servants that I really love is sick. He's dying. I need you to heal him. But don't come. I believe in your authority. I believe in who you are. You, I know you can just say the word and heal him from here. And Jesus says, nobody has faith in Israel like this Roman centurion has faith. And so he heals this man's servant. Then they come to a small town. And, and, and like many communities uh, in Jesus' day, those communities were walled cities or walled towns. It kept everybody safe at night from attackers. And as they are walking in through the front gates of the city, a funeral is leaving the gates and a widow is burying her only son. And Jesus touches essentially the coffin, the box that this body is in, and this boy is raised to life. So Jesus is doing these amazing miracles in Luke 7. And that leads us to, to verse 17. Because after hearing about those two miracles, John sends messengers to Jesus. And it reads like this. This news about Jesus, that he's been healing, raising the dead, spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. John's disciples told him about all these things. And he called two of them, and he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? And when the men came to Jesus, they said, John sent us to you to ask, are you the one to come or should we expect someone else? Now, I don't know about you, but this, to me, is one of the heaviest moments in all of Jesus' ministry. John has believed before anyone else believed. He believed that Jesus was who he said he was. He saw God break the rules of nature. God opens the window of heaven and just kind of calls down, John, that's my son. Yes, do what he says. Guys, I'm with him. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove. I mean, it's just miracle upon miracle happening here. John is witness to this, but his circumstances get tough enough that as he sits in a Roman cell, by himself in the dark, he thinks, if Jesus really is him, then why aren't my circumstances changing? Have you ever been there? That's doubt. That's doubt. If Jesus, if you really are who you say you are, then why am I sitting here? Think about what John is thinking. I'm sitting here because I did something righteous. Jesus, I've obeyed you the whole way. And what has it gotten me? I'm here by myself. I'm stuck. You're healing blind eyes. You're raising dead people. You can't come bring me a key to get out of this prison cell? The guy who maybe is the most confident of anyone in the, new, in the Gospels that Jesus is who he says he is, is sitting and wrestling with doubt. And can I just hit home with us a little bit here? When you and I see God working in someone else's life, in someone else's story, while our situation remains the same, sometimes doubt creeps in. Tell you, man, I, I watched my mom roll my brother's wheelchair up to the altar many times as a kid because some guest speaker wanted to pray for his healing. And every time he rolled back to his seat unchanged. 
There were times when someone else on the other side of that altar got healed the same service. That's a, that's a soil for doubt, isn't it? It's hard. It's not easy. It's not easy when you and I are asking God to do something and we feel like we're not seeing Him do it and then we see Him do it for someone else. If we're not careful, doubt really creeps in in those moments. Imagine how John must have been feeling here. He knew Jesus was God's Son before birth. He knew that God chose him to prepare the way for Jesus. He walked with God. He lived a set-apart life, very what we would call an ascetic lifestyle. He wore like goat skins and ate locusts and spent a whole bunch of time out in the wilderness by himself talking to God. You and I would say that guy needs institutionalized, but yet he was closer to God than anybody. He saw heaven torn open when he baptized Jesus. He knew Jesus was the Son of God. John knew much and had seen much and experienced much, but the weight of his current circumstances and his confusion surrounding what Jesus was doing got so heavy that he started to doubt. We get this, don't we? We understand this. It's easy for us to think that John should have known better, but we can relate to this easily. We've all done our share of wrestling with doubt about what God is doing. God, are you really present in this? God, did I hear you right? Do you care? Do you see this? Are you paying attention? Doubt becomes a very real struggle in our walk with Jesus. In my own seasons of doubt, if I'm being real transparent with you, in my own seasons of doubt, it's not just been my questions that feel heavy. Sometimes the very fact that we know we're doubting makes things feel twice as hard. Do you know what I mean? It's like I'm doubting and now I feel guilty that I'm doubting God. And it gets even heavier and it gets even harder. In Hebrews 11 verse 1, God gives us a very clear, short definition of what it means to have faith in Him. It says, faith is confident, having confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That means the act of you and I having faith in God means that we have a confidence in something that we don't have yet. And we have assurance about something that we cannot see it is not in front of us that's why faith is the one is one of the things you and i will not have to exercise once we die no need for faith in heaven why because we will see fully in heaven faith is for this life in the next life faith is realized faith is fulfilled faith is perfected in this life we have to believe in what we are not seeing yet so the idea that we have faith in God is a big deal. It means that we've chosen to examine the evidence of the world around us and the life experience behind us and the lives of people around us and the work that God has done inside of us. And after all of that, we've chosen to believe in God even though we haven't seen Him yet. Amen? I mean, that's faith. That's a big deal. If you, know, if you know the book of Hebrews, you know the rest of chapter 11 tells us about how powerful faith is in our lives. But there's a reality that we've got to stay aware of, and that is that the faith journey is not an ever um, upward climb. Maybe it has been for you. If it, if it has been, you're the only person I've known. <laughs> Typically, our faith journey looks sometimes a little bit like a Richter scale, doesn't it? Up and down and up and down. And we set ourselves up for failure and self-condemnation if we think that we should never, ever wrestle with doubt. In fact, the first time sin entered the world, it entered because God's first two people doubted. The two people who saw him, two people who walked with him in the garden, two people who knew him better than anyone on earth will ever know him in terms of intimacy. They doubted what was true of him. Genesis 3, the devil shows up disguised as a snake. 
He starts asking them questions. Did God say don't eat from any tree? Eve says, no, he didn't say don't eat from any tree. He said don't eat from that tree. And the devil doesn't give up so easy, right? So he says, she, she tells him, he told us not to eat from that tree or we'll die. And the devil says, that's not, that's not what he meant. He knows that if you eat from that tree, you'll have the knowledge that he has. And in that moment, Eve is set up to decide between, do I believe what God has said about himself, or do I believe what someone else is saying about him? And enough doubt crept in that sin found good soil. All it took was one shred of doubt. Verse 6 says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She already knew what was true from God, from his own lips. Don't touch that tree. She knew it, but in a moment of doubt, it wrecked everything. Doubt is something you and I are going to wrestle with to varying degrees until the breath leaves our lungs and we enter heaven. Here's what I'm trying to say. The reason why doubt is, such a, is going to be such a real part of your journey of faith is, first of all, because circumstances get hard for all of us. None of us have an easy life. And second of all, the devil despises your soul. He hates you as much as he can possibly hate you. And if doubt is the way to get him to undo your walk with God, you better believe he's going to lean on that as heavy as he can. You're going to wrestle with this. Christian, don't get discouraged when you wrestle with doubt. Wrestle with it the right way. It has the potential to shipwreck us if we wrestle with it away from the presence of God. So let's get, let's get back to John the Baptist here. What he knows about Jesus, what he knows about God, are not aligning with what he's experiencing with God. And that's a, key, that's a key thing for us to understand. Because if you're like me, there have been seasons in your life that what you know about God from his word, what you know about God from the people around you, what you know about your interaction with him in any given moment sometimes doesn't feel like it's aligning with what you're experiencing. God, your word says you give me joy. I have none. God, your word says you give me peace. Where is it? God, your word says you'll provide for me. I'm definitely in need. We go through these seasons where doubt tries to weasel its way in. And John is experiencing that very thing. He's probably sitting there in a dark, cold cell saying, Jesus came to usher in God's kingdom, but I'm sitting here as a prisoner of Rome's kingdom. Jesus came to change the system. The system's still oppressing me. Jesus came to set prisoners free. Hello, I'm a prisoner and I'm not free. Jesus came to fix all of this and nothing's different yet. John is probably sitting there in that cell having that very conversation with himself. And the devil seizes these moments with you and I trying to convince us that God isn't interested in us. Maybe we think about other people who face struggles and God didn't come through for them the way they wanted him to. Maybe we think about times when we were desperate for God to answer a prayer and and it seemed like he didn't listen then either. All of that makes Jesus' response to John's question so powerful. Because I want you to picture this. Jesus is here and the crowd has been following him because he's waking up dead people and he's healing people. He's basically calling in healing for them. Like, go home. That person's going to be fine. I don't need to see them or touch them. They're going to be healed. He's doing these miracles that are drawing a crowd. And as this crowd is following him everywhere he goes, John's messengers run up to him straight from John's prison cell. And they're saying, hey, John is asking us. He's desperate to know, is it really you or not? Are you the one or not? And I want you to notice this. This is so good. In verse 21, it says, At that very time. So they've asked him. They've come to him. Jesus, are you the Son of God or not? And it says, At that very time, Jesus does not answer them. Here's what he does instead. He pivots from them. And it says, He cured many who had diseases and sicknesses and evil spirits. And gave sight to many who were blind. 
See, that crowd was full of messed up, broken bodies. Makes sense, doesn't it? If you've got a blind person at your house and you hear Jesus can make somebody else see, you're like, guess where we're going? Wherever Jesus is, right? So this crowd is full of sick people. There's maybe leprous people hanging out on the edge of it, hoping that Jesus might get their attention because they're not allowed to get very close. And these guys come up and they say, John's wondering if you're the Messiah. And he's like, well, hang on a second. Healing, 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 healing. Deliverance. You're not leprous anymore. You're not blind anymore. You can hear. You're not sick anymore. Demons are coming out of these people. He's doing this work at that very time, Luke says. And then he replied to his messengers. So he does these miracles and he comes back to these guys and he says, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. This moment is so crazy. It's as if Jesus is saying, Oh, John's wondering if I'm the Messiah. Tell him what you saw. Boom. Boom, 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 boom. And he starts to do the work that only the Son of God could do. Demons leave people. Leprosy's gone. And if I'm one of these messengers who's come to Jesus and asked this question, if I had any doubt, it's gone, right? In an instant, that doubt is gone. But it's not just what Jesus does here that has weight to it. I want you to pay attention to this, friend. It's what he says. Let's read it again. He replied to his messengers, go back and report to John what you've seen. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. You may not know it, but Jesus is actually quoting the Old Testament when he gives them this list. Earlier in Luke's gospel, he shows up to his hometown church in Nazareth, And he visits. And one of the traditions in Jewish culture, at least in the first century, was if you were a visitor, you were kind of the guest speaker. So if maybe this is your first Sunday today, this is similar to me saying, hey, we've never seen you before. Would you like to stand up and talk to us? Jesus shows up. They're like, he hasn't been here in a while. Maybe he's got something to say. So he stands up and he calls for what what would have been the Bible to them. It would be the Old Testament on big, heavy scrolls. And they turn the scrolls to Isaiah chapter 61. This is a prophecy that everyone knew had to do with the Messiah, the coming Son of God. And Jesus stands up among people who knew Him as a child and reads these words, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. So we've got that on the list. He sent me to proclaim freedom from the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is taking an Old Testament Scripture that speaks to, about the Son of God, and He stands up and He reads it in front of His hometown people. And then the last thing He says is this, today that Scripture is fulfilled. You know what He's saying? That's talking about me. That verse is talking about me. Then later on in Luke chapter 7, what we just read, as, Jesus, as John's disciples ask Jesus whether he's the Messiah, he essentially does exactly what these verses say the Messiah will do. So are you catching what's going on here? He's taking a verse of Scripture that these guys would be familiar with, and he's saying, John's wondering if I'm the Messiah. I just did everything that Isaiah 61 says. Except one thing. Did you notice it? The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. It's tough for John. When Jesus quotes that verse to these guys, what does he leave out? The one thing John is probably hoping for the most. Jesus, that you'd set me free. You know what's going on here? John's expectations of what Jesus would do are hitting the reality, and they don't agree. And doubt is showing up in John's life. 
So he's wrestling with this, right? And Jesus works these miracles and he tells his messengers, basically very subtly, he tells them, yeah, I am the Messiah. That doesn't mean John's going to go free. And the last thing he tells them to tell his cousin, someone he probably spent a lot of time with in his childhood, maybe one of his closest friends in life, the last thing he tells them to tell John is this. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Maybe your Bible says it like this. Blessed is anyone who is not offended by me. Or maybe it says, blessed is anyone who does not fall away on account of me. Listen, if you've ever wrestled with doubt, these words are for you. John is someone that Jesus loves dearly. John is someone who understands him better than most. And he's wrestling with doubt. And the message Jesus sends to him is this. And I think it's the same message he sends to you and I. John, I'm not done in, in my ministry. I'm not done. I know this is tough. But I'm still everything I told you I am. I'm still the son of God. And I see you right where you're at. But in the moments when your expectations of me don't match up to your experience, you will be blessed if you don't give up. Because I'm still up to something. You just don't know what it is yet. Friend, in your doubt, may you understand that when your expectations of what God would do are not aligning with what he is currently doing, may you understand what he's saying to you here in Luke 7. I'm still God. I still have a plan. I'm still powerful. And just because you don't understand what I'm doing yet doesn't mean I'm not at work. And if you're doubting me, understand I'm still everything I say I am. It's moments like these that I think we find relatable. When we see what God is doing or isn't doing in our lives and we compare it to what we wish he was doing, we realize something tough. Far too often, God does not meet our expectations. He always meets his own. But he doesn't always meet ours. And we all, let's be real, we all have expectations on God, don't we? It's okay that we do. We should. It's part of taking him at his word. But Jesus, I think, would, I think, would gently but firmly encourage us with this truth. Because what he's saying to John is something he's also saying to us. If your expectations of me do not align with your reality, choose to trust me and doubt yourself, not the other way around. I'm going to say that again. If your expectations of me are not re- aligning with your reality, choose to trust me and doubt yourself, not the other way around. See, too often when we struggle, what do we begin to do? We begin to doubt God and trust our own ability. That doesn't work. It's no different than me standing here in the fridge and telling Sammy, it's not here. And she's like, I know it's there, right? Right? When I trust my own ability instead of the Lord. When I trust my own interpretation of circumstances instead of trusting that he already knows what's going on. When I do that, I set myself up for failure in my walk with him. If you're wrestling with doubt this morning because of the weight of all the stuff you're facing in your life. If healing seems like it's far away and your children seem like they're struggling and maybe marriage is as hard for you as it's ever been, maybe you're desperate for change and an intervention from God and you're just not seeing it happen. If whatever your struggle is feels like it's getting heavier and not lighter and you're starting to doubt God, know that He's not disappointed in you for your struggle. He's not mad that you've got questions and He's not intimidated by any of them. Just like He was with John, Jesus is not offended at your weakness. But here's what he desperately wants you to hold on to. 
He's still all you'll ever need, even if your expectations don't get met. God can still be all-powerful and all-loving and concerned and involved in your life, even when things happen differently than you wanted them to. John wanted freedom from prison. He sent messengers hoping to get a promise from Jesus that he'd be walking out of prison. What John got was, yes, I am at work. Yes, I am doing Messiah things. But you are going to stay put, John. He is still the Son of God. He still has a plan. He is still working. Heaven is still for you. All of that can be true and you can still have unmet expectations between you and God. He won't always meet our expectations, but here's what He will do. He will make sure that in the end, He will win. And what we like to say around here is this, when He wins, I win. Amen. When Jesus has His victory over sin at the cross, that means I get victory over sin in my life over 2,000 years later. When He has victory, I have victory because I am in Christ. We may have unmet expectations with God. If you do, you're in good company. We can look all throughout Scripture and see it. Maybe we could dig into stories like Elijah standing up for God on, on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18. God pours down fire from heaven and swallows up the sacrifice. And Elijah kills all these prophets of Baal in, in this moment. It's a wild, crazy moment. And Elijah probably thinks the whole country is going to turn back to God right now. Instead, the king and his wife say, we're going to kill you the next chance we get. Talk about unmet expectations. Elijah thinks God's going to turn everything around. Instead, he's like, oh, I guess I'm going to die today. I better run for my life, right? All throughout Scripture, Moses kills an Egyptian in the early part of the book of Exodus. The book of Acts tells us he thought that was the day that God was going to set his people free. Instead, it was the day that sent Moses into 40 years of isolation in the wilderness. Talk about unmet expectations. The best people we see in Scripture still wrestle with unmet expectations from God. Sometimes they lead us to doubt. And while your expectations may not always be met by God, listen, friend, you will never, you will never, you will never experience a broken promise from Him. What He says He'll do, He will do. In His way, in His time, with the story that He's writing, in His power, with His mighty hand, in your life, for your glory, He will do it. Amen? Amen. Now I want to talk to you a little bit as we wrap up this morning about, I think, the best part of this story. Because the most striking part of this scene that we've looked at in Luke 7 is what Jesus says about John after John's disciples leave. These two guys have known each other their entire lives. John has just revealed to his cousin that his faith in him is struggling in a mighty way. After everything that John had seen God do, now he's sitting here because life is so hard and heavy, he's wondering if God is really working through Jesus like he thought he would. Now let's turn this a little bit. Imagine you're in the place of Jesus. I try to do this. I'm terrible at it because I know how far off I am from being Jesus, right? But imagine you're Jesus. And you think, man, John, John knew it was me from the beginning. John's the one that baptized me. John saw the Holy Spirit descend on me. John heard the voice of the Father talk to him. You know, if you're Jesus, you might be tempted to think, what is this guy doing? Doesn't he know better? Maybe you might even take this moment to look at the crowd and say, hey guys, don't be like my cousin who can't remember who I am. Don't be tempted to do that. Maybe if you and I were in Jesus' shoes, we might think about saying or doing something like that. Thank God that that's not what happens. After hearing John's deepest doubt, 
Listen, after the lowest moment in John the Baptist's life, as Jesus hears his deepest doubt and fear, Jesus turns back to this crowd who's been following him, and this is what he says. What kind of man did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. So Jesus is setting this up and he's saying, look, when John was baptizing out there in the wilderness, what did you go out there to see? A guy who was controlled by the government? No. A guy who just kind of did whatever he felt like from day to day? No. A guy who was impressive from a worldly perspective? No. He goes on. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. And I tell you, more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. And listen to this. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. What Jesus is saying with that last part of the sentence is this. Everyone who comes to, to follow the Lord because of me is having a greater experience than what everyone had leading up to John. But I want to focus on what he said before that. Because John is weak in this moment. He's weak. He's discouraged. He's sad. He's lonely. He's heartbroken. He's just revealed to Jesus that his faith is struggling. And Jesus turns to the crowd. And you know what he says? John's the greatest guy who ever lived. What? In his doubt? In his struggle? In his weakness? Jesus, that's what you want to say? Yeah, that's what he wants to say. You think God can't handle your doubts? You think God's angry at you because sometimes you question whether he's moving or working or not? You think God is heaping shame on you because your situation is getting hard and heavy and you're not sure how it's going to go? Understand that the guy who should have known best in his moment of doubt, Jesus responded by telling anyone he could, He's the best guy that ever lived. Friend, the grace that, God's ha- that God has for you in your weakness is far greater than you can comprehend. The grace that God has for you in your weakness is so much greater than you can comprehend. As John sits and second guesses himself in prison, Jesus is telling a crowd miles away, He's the greatest person who was ever born to a mother and a father. (laughs) That's amazing. That's for us. That's for us in our moments of weakness. We do battle with religious mindsets. And we lose to the enemy a lot. So when we doubt, we start to think things like, God must be mad that I'm struggling this way. God must be angry that I feel like I'm teetering on unbelief. Instead, he looks at you and says, if you only knew what I think about you, and if you'll only remember what I've done for you, all of your doubt would disappear. I don't know who this message is for this morning. Maybe it's not for anybody. Maybe I just missed the Lord today. I don't know. But for those who might be wrestling in seasons of their own doubt. Maybe you're doubting whether God is good or powerful or present. Maybe you're doubting whether he, you can ever please him or whether you can ever overcome the sin that you're struggling with and honor God with your life. Maybe you're doubting whether your circumstances will ever change. I want to give you some encouragement this morning, okay? Can I do that? First of all, just very, very simple encouragement. First of all, his word is a firewall against doubt. His word is a firewall against doubt. 
You know, what we're tempted to do, if we're not careful, is to give our experiences more credibility than what God has already said to us. And usually our experiences tend to win out because they're newer, right? And they're full of emotion. So I feel alone, so I must be alone. I feel abandoned, so I must be abandoned. And we let our experiences carry all the weight. But listen, I want to encourage you for a moment, friend. And and we say this a lot. It is so, so, so important that you get to know this book. God only wrote one. He only wrote one. It is so important that you get to know this book. In our struggles against unbelief, we cannot discount that, listen, this book has endured through the ages. It has been affirmed by science and archaeology and historians and researchers. Even people who fought to disprove it have, and, and, and disprove its accuracy and its power have found this book affirmed again and again and again through the rise and the fall of civilizations. Look, if this book is timeless enough to do that, if it is still changing lives today, maybe you can trust that what it says about him is true for you. That is so important. And I know you might feel like preachers, we're always getting back to read your Bible and pray. And maybe in a sense we are. But look, understand this. The reason why He gave us a book is because our experiences do get loud and hot and heavy. And the emotion that we experience in our lives does get ramped up all the way to 11. We need something stable. We need something stable. This book is unchanging. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. This book is God's truth for my life, transcending time and culture and persecution. His word is a firewall against doubt. If I want to know how God might work in my life, I should know how he has worked in someone else's. If I want to know what God says about me, it's in here. If I want to know how everything ends, it's in here. If I want to know every promise Jesus ever made, they're in here. His word is a firewall against doubt. So if you're doubting what God is doing, know that you can rely on what He's already said He would do. And I want to say something that someone in the room probably won't like. And that's okay. God does not always work in miracles. but he always affirms his word. He always affirms his word. He always, always, always affirms his word. Doesn't mean we shouldn't ask for miracles. Doesn't mean we shouldn't believe for miracles. It just means, friend, that sometimes we need the non-emotional standard of what God has already said to us and lean into this book 100% instead of just looking for a quick fix. His word is a firewall against doubt. The second encouragement I want to give you is this. Don't let one page of your story redefine an entire chapter or the whole book. At times, we let our doubts about God... Listen, I'm talking to everybody in the room here. At times, we let our doubts about God override everything else we've seen Him do in our lives. Can I just tell you, friend, some of you are not giving God enough credit for the good that he's done in your life, but you're way too quick to decide he's given up on you when things get rough. You and I need to be able to look back. I need to be able to look back at 41 and a half years of my life and see faithfulness, 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 faithfulness from God. And if I face a crisis tomorrow, instead of saying, well, I guess God's not here, I should be able to remember That one page of difficulty in my life story should not give me the license to rewrite the entire chapter that he's been writing. In your toughest seasons, don't lose sight of who he has been. We say this kind of thing a lot around here, but look, if God was going to give up on you, he would have by now. He would have. If he was going to give up on you as a believer, why didn't he give up on you as an unbeliever? Why why would he choose now? 
He's not going to give up on you. So don't let one tough season or one chapter, maybe it's a long season, maybe it's decades, I get that. Don't let one chapter in your story decide that the whole book God is writing is no good. He is trustworthy. You can lean on Him. He's still that God in your crisis, even if He's not working the way you want or expect Him to. Last thing I want to give you, if you're struggling with doubt, as you wrestle with doubt, remember that the counsel you choose has consequences. The counsel you choose has consequences. This is where your relationships here in the church matter. I want to tell you something and uh, I just believe this wholeheartedly. Who you seek out and who you listen to has a great impact on what happens with your doubt. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with the term that's used a lot in culture lately? Uh, it's called confirmation bias. Anybody know that term? Confirmation bias basically means this. I seek out advice from people that will only affirm to me what I already think is true. So basically every 24-hour news cycle is confirmation bias for someone. Some news channel, depending on what your politics are, depending on what your opinions are, our, our, our information has become terribly a confirmation bias in this world. If I want someone to tell me that our president's the Antichrist, I can find someone to confirm that. If I want someone to tell me that the other guy is, someone will tell me that too. Confirmation bias. It's this idea that you and I seek out people that we think will affirm us instead of shoot us straight. I want to give you this encouragement, friend. In your doubt, please hear this. Choose your counsel wisely. Choose your counsel wisely. I want to tell you something that I hope is relieving to many of you. God is not afraid of your questions. There's not a question you and I can ask that intimidates the creator of all things. You're not going to stump the guy who put stars into place. Right? Like God's not afraid of your questions. He's not disappointed in you. He always has the best answers. You can ask it. You can wonder it. You can wrestle with your doubt. But listen to me. Processing your doubts with someone who has already chosen to walk away from Jesus or processing your doubts with someone who is grinding an axe against the church because they feel like they got mistreated or processing your doubts with someone who wrestles with bitterness about their own life will not lead you toward Jesus. It won't. I've seen this happen in the church over and over and over again. Someone, and this is going to get really personal, and I might have to explain this, but someone in this room, maybe you've struggled in your marriage. Be careful about seeking counsel from someone who gave up on theirs too early. Because what are they going to tell you? Forget it, man. It's not worth it. Now that doesn't mean, I want to, this is why there's so much clarity that needs to come with this. That doesn't mean that we put up with abuse. That doesn't mean, I'm not encouraging any of that. I'm just using that as a very simple example to say, friend, that who you seek out matters. Who you talk to matters. Seek godly counsel in your doubts. That's all I'm saying. Seek godly counsel in your doubts. Seek out someone who has endured hard stuff and is still leaning on Jesus. Not someone who endured the hard stuff and gave up on Him. Seek out someone who is battle-tested in this life. Be willing to let God cause your doubts to be doubted. He invites us to not just seek godly counsel from maybe someone in this room or someone in your life. But I think the bigger question is, ask God to show himself faithful while you doubt. While you struggle. While you question. He knows how to do it. God cares enough about you, friend, 
to help you, to encourage you, to send you a sign that only you could get, to send you the people that can speak truth into your circumstance. I think what he is desperately wanting you and I to avoid is to process our doubts as we back away from him. A couple years ago, a story came out about a pastor who was struggling with doubt in his life. He made a strange decision. He decided to live for a year as if God did not exist. Do you know what that pastor did at the end of that year? Decide that God doesn't exist. Surprising, right? Friend, you're loved. Maybe you're a church kid like me, and maybe deep inside you've got some tough questions that you're wondering if God would answer. Maybe... Maybe you've gone through more recent heartbreak and you're just wondering where God's at in the middle of it. Can I just tell you, if you're doubting, if you're struggling, God loves you right there. And he wants you to lean into him and not away from him. Would you close your eyes with me? You know, we said earlier <clears throat> that Jesus didn't die on the cross for you and I to act as though we didn't need it. And that's true. That's true. We shouldn't walk into his house and act like we don't have sin. We shouldn't walk into his house and act like we don't need forgiveness. In the same vein, we shouldn't walk into this place and act like we've never had doubt. We struggle do battle. Not every day is easy. In fact, very few of them are. But I believe the Lord would encourage you and I with this truth that he is present even in our struggles, in our doubts. He's present even when we're not sure he is. He's working even when we have no clue that he is. That's why we're ending our service this morning with communion. Because Jesus did not just die on the cross for the sins that we give a lot of attention to. He didn't just die on the cross for addictions or anger issues or mental health struggles that we have. He didn't, he didn't just die on the cross for some of the stuff that we tend to list right off the top, right? He also died to help you kill your doubt. to help you see the work of the enemy where he questions you blocked by the presence of the Holy Spirit. We serve a God who's big enough to handle all of your questions. Every single one. God, why did that happen? God, why did this not happen? God, why did you do it for someone else? God, why haven't you done it yet? We serve a God who shed his blood on the cross to put those things to rest for us. And when we struggle, he's a God who loves us through it, doesn't shame us. On the night Jesus went to the cross, and the last meal that he had with his disciples he instituted what we're about to do together, communion. He took some bread and passed it to them. They didn't understand what he was doing. But he told them, take a piece of this bread and break it off and eat it. It's my body. Take a drink of this cup. It's my blood. And every time you gather in this way, remember, remember, remember why I came. In this moment, we remember that Jesus died for our doubts and every other sin, every other struggle, every other battle, every other weakness we've got. Lord, we thank you that there is no limit to what the cross can accomplish in our lives. There's no limit. There's no sin you can't cover. There's no question you can't erase. 
There's no season where we struggled or walked away that you can't overlook, that you can't pour out your blood on and forgive. So we gather here together, God, so many of us in situations that are not as we wish they were, things that are not as good as we hoped they would be, things that we just desperately wish had been different. So many things, God, so many ways where maybe you haven't met our expectations. We ask you in this moment, God, to remind us that even though our expectations are not met, you are still God, you are still working, and you still have deep, abiding, perfect love for us. May the shed blood of Jesus be our constant reminder that you see us and you care about what we are enduring. In your awesome name we pray. Let's take the bread together. And the cup. I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. I'd like to ask our board and our staff to come and be prepared to pray. Spouses, if you're comfortable coming along, please do that. Okay, friends. God wants to work in your situation right where you're at. Right where you're at. We don't gather these across the front to create an intentionally uncomfortable situation for you. I just believe it's best for us to not process our struggles alone. So maybe you're here this morning and you've got a need. Maybe it has nothing to do with doubt. Maybe you're just sick. Maybe you've got some other thing going on. I want these that are across the front to just be able to pray with you, to encourage you, to, to, to do what we call intercede for you. Step in and ask the Lord to do great things in your life. But especially if you're here and you're wrestling with doubt in your life and in your story, I want to encourage you. Would you come? Just come. Nobody here is going to ask for your whole life story. You don't have to tell it but we're ready to pray with you. We're ready to encourage you. We're ready to believe that the Lord wants to work in a unique way. I'm gonna pray with you uh, to dismiss. We hope you have a great, great rest of your Sunday and a great week. We love you. We'd love to see you back for a prayer meeting. Uh, But Lord, we bring uh, ourselves to you. We bring our church to you. We believe, God, uh, that you're present with us even as as we struggle in every season uh, that we're in, that you're right there with us. We believe that you give us all the strength we need to navigate our struggles well. God, my prayer in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, is that you would remind us that you're near as we doubt, that we'd lean on your word more than our feelings, that we would not try to rewrite the chapters of our lives, that we wouldn't choose poor counsel, but that we'd lean into you and trust you and your word and believe that you are doing great things even if we haven't seen it yet. May we lean on you, God, and not on our doubts. Lord, we want to be a people of true, rich, abiding faith in you. Help us navigate those seasons where it's weak and watch you do great things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you come if you need prayer? If not, God bless you. We love you. We hope you have a great, great week.